controversial and disagreeable speech is exactly what the speech clause is designed to protect. The heart of the problem is that too many principals and school board members don't know or don't understand the limits the Constitution places on their ability to control what students say. And others simply disregard the law because they don't like it. very pleased to have Catherine J. Ross with us to discuss her book, Lessons in Censorship, How Schools and Courts Subvert Students' First Amendment Rights, as part of our Friday Forum series. Professor of Law at the George Washington University Law School and a visiting scholar at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Catherine has also been a visiting professor at Boston College, the University of Pennsylvania, and St. John's School of Law. I'm going to start um, just by reading the opening passage from my book. And then I will stick a little closer to a text than I usually like to, just because I could talk for the rest of the day and into the evening about this topic, and I want to keep myself in line so that I can get to your questions and comments, which I always really enjoy hearing. You lose all constitutional rights once you enter a school building, a school official in Suffolk County, New York, proclaimed in the spring of 2012. You're not allowed to do this, she asserted, as she confiscated flyers from an indignant student who was protesting her friend's five-day suspension. Layering censorship upon censorship, the episode had a surreal quality to it. The student whose plight prompted the pamphlets had been punished for voicing her opposition to bullying in a way the school deemed inappropriate after a parent complained. The seizure was as clueless as it was surreal. It was also quite representative of things that happen virtually every day across the United States. The First Amendment protects the speech rights of public school students in grades kindergarten through 12, and yet schools all over the country regularly censor constitutionally protected speech, and judges often let them get away with it. Censorship as I use the term here, includes both preventing a student from speaking and punishing the student after they speak for words that are protected. And speech also means not only what I'm doing right now in the sense of talking, but also writing, wearing symbols, wearing t-shirts with slogans. All of those are speech for constitutional purposes. Schools silence and punish students who express their own opinions on every side of important issues, including national and local politics, the rights of LGBT persons, guns, abortion, and more. They suspended a six-year-old who called a classmate a poo-poo head in the playground. They stopped an elementary school girl from praying before eating her own lunch, and another from distributing a homemade flyer that began, hi, my name is MB, and I want to tell you why finding Christ is like finding your lost dog. In the upper grades, schools suspend kids for wearing t-shirts. Um, for example, two boys in different schools who wore political t-shirts, one praising the Marines and their rifle, and the other criticizing President George W. Bush as a substance abusing, draft dodging chicken hawk. More recently, a school in Texas sent a student who had never been disciplined before to an alternative school for troubled youth because of a rap song that he composed and recorded off campus and posted to YouTube. And I'll come back to that case at the end of my comments. The Constitution protects all of this expression, as well as speech that adults consider worthless, including adolescent humor that many of us cannot understand. Students are especially likely to get in trouble for two things. One is criticizing their teachers and school officials, and the other is for words that someone else's parent finds offensive. Offensive means the adult disagrees with it. But controversial and disagreeable speech is exactly what the speech clause is designed to protect. The heart of the problem is that too many principals and school board members don't know or don't understand the limits the Constitution places on their ability to control what students say. 
and others simply disregard the law because they don't like it. As I worked on this book, almost everyone I talked to informally had a censorship story from their own childhood or their children's lives. Longtime teachers told me incredulously they just had no idea that students had First Amendment rights. One actually asked me, what a creative idea. Where did you ever get the idea for this book? So uh, moving forward and what I'm going to do in the time remaining to me, I'm going to first give you a very brief and I hope not technical overview of the law. And the book uh, obviously has legal discussion, but I worked very hard to make it accessible to people who have had no exposure to legal doctrine. And then I'm going to tell some stories that highlight some of the issues that have particular contemporary resonance before I turn this over for the questions and comments. So first, the law. The speech clause is very concise. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. We understand this to mean that the government, at all of its levels, from the most local to national, and anyone acting on behalf of the government may not silence speech because of its content or its viewpoint or the words that people choose to express themselves. The manner of expression is part of communication. School districts and everyone who works for them, from the principal to the lunch lady, are the government when we talk about freedom of speech. So here's a whirlwind tour of the constitutional rules for schools. The court first took up the, this court, when I say the court, meaning the Supreme Court, took up the issue of student speech rights in 1943, in one of the earliest cases in which the court upheld individual speech rights. The case was Barnett versus West Virginia, and it involved elementary school students, sisters, who were Jehovah's Witnesses and who were at risk of being expelled from school and sent to a juvenile reformatory because they refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. They believed that that was worshiping a graven image. It violated their religion. The consequences today can also be dire. Many students are suspended, expelled, sent to special schools for disciplinary problems, and really begun on the path from school, what we call the school to prison pipeline, because they are suspended, miss work, get a bad record, and the rest of their lives uh, is really impacted, and often because they engaged in speech that the Constitution protects. So in Barnett, the court held that people, including young students, couldn't be forced to say what was not in their minds. We call that compelled speech. The government is not allowed to compel speech. And the court emphasized the constitutional limits on the state's coercive powers and that the First Amendment was designed to protect nonconformists of all stripes. The court specially focused on schools, although it never suggested that the rules in schools should be different from the rules outside of schools. It said, because schools are educating the young for citizenship, they must scrupulously protect individual rights. If we're not to strangle the free mind at its source and teach youth to discount important principles of government as mere platitudes. Decades later, the court returned to the student speech problem and it began to carve out a special way of assessing claims that schools illegally censored student expression. So when a student complains, my rights have been violated, what legal test is the court going to apply? And we have one test that is very strict outside of schools. But the court began to say we can have a slightly easier test to look at the government that lets the government censor more speech in school. So the first and iconic case, Tinker versus Des Moines, and here I'm just going to show you a list of the names so you don't have to strain to remember them, but you don't have to remember them. Um, and Tinker versus Des Moines uh, decided at the height of the Vietnam War, 
uh, the court held that, student, that the school had violated the First Amendment rights of students because they suspended them for wearing black armbands in protest against the war. The court took into account all of the things that society counts on schools to accomplish, especially the importance of educating the young for citizenship, and said, OK, schools are a special environment. They can have a special test. And it announced that schools could not censor student expression unless authorities had reason to anticipate that the speech could lead to material disruption or collide with the rights of others. And this is known in brief as the material disruption test. As the court became more conservative, under each new chief justice, it gradually carved out a series of exceptions to the material disruption test in three later cases. These gave schools more and more power to censor student speech, but they did not strip students of all their speech rights. Two of the exceptions gave schools the discretion to censor student expression that's lewd. And, um, and in, in the second, uh, gave them discretion to censor speech that advocates for the use of illegal substances, that's drugs and underage drinking, um, which you might recognize as the bung hits for Jesus case. <laughs> the most important exception stems from the case of Hazelwood versus Kohlmeier, a 1988 decision that created a whole new category of speech the court labeled school-sponsored. Although the student is speaking or writing, if the speech is classified as school-sponsored, it's treated as if it is no longer the student's own expression. To be school-sponsored, the speech must appear to bear the school's imprimatur, or as Justice Alito put it, to be the school's own speech, in the sense that the speech was screened and approved of by the school. So a reasonable person could think that the school stood behind the expression. This reaches virtually all expression in school publications, performances, extracurricular activities, and more, stripping students of their own voices. So schools use these exceptions to try to avoid at all costs the material disruption standard because they usually lose if that's the standard. Um, they claim, for example, that cursing is always lewd and can be punished, even if the curse has nothing to do with sex, and if it's in, for example, a piece of classical literature that the student is reading aloud, or if the student mutters a curse under her breath, thinking no one will hear it. Students have been punished for all of those things. Some schools have even begun to assert that what students themselves say in class or hand in in a homework assignment that only their teacher sees is school-sponsored speech because it occurs in an educational context. Well, this is absurd because nobody could possibly believe that the school knew what the student would say before it came out of the student's mouth. The student probably didn't know what the student was going to say. Or remember that student who always says, oh, I forget. OK, so not school sponsored, but schools claim that. Um, and this is really important because teachers in many parts of the country don't have the right to disagree with or criticize the viewpoint that's presented in the textbook that the Board of Education chose. This limits the range of discussion and disagreement in a classroom rather than promoting critical thinking. Students are the only source of disagreement from the official agenda. And uh, although my book doesn't really go into the curricular disputes, I'm sure you're all aware of the kinds of battles that have raged over how to teach biology and evolution, courses on sex education, and even how we look at American history. So one more important point, I want to anticipate a couple of concerns that many people have. Schools may always clamp down on speech that would be illegal outside of school. That kind of speech is not protected by the Constitution. So 
the very rare category we call true threats, very hard standard to satisfy, but where it's really you anticipate uh, that violence is going to follow, that can be limited, as can legal harassment, in other words, something that meets the legal definition of harassment, libel, and so forth. And more important, if speech anywhere outside of school or in school seems to threaten violence on the school campus, the authorities can always isolate that student and try to find out what's going on. They don't have to endanger anybody in the school. So that's the taxonomy. Um, Schools may restrict and punish student expression that would be fully protected outside of school only if they can show reasonable apprehension the speech will lead to material disorder, the speech appears to be the school's own, it's lewd or has sexual connotations, or it appears to advocate the use of illegal substances. Because I understand how difficult it is for laypersons who are not lawyers and who have to make decisions sort of split second about how to deal with student expression that appears to be um, potentially disruptive or troubling, I developed a chart that tries to guide um, principals and teachers as they deal with these situations. I would hope that school principals would all have it up in their office like the chart about the Heimlich maneuver that you see in restaurants. <laughs> so it tells them, stop and think before you silence and punish speech. Make sure you've put it in the right category and that you're using the right way of understanding it. So if it is what I call pure student speech, speech that doesn't meet any of those exceptions, you need to stop and not silence it unless you can really point to evidence from your school that this is likely to cause a disruption. If it is school-sponsored, slow down, make sure it really does appear to be the school's own speech, and then you have to have a legitimate pedagogical reason for censoring it. You can't just say, it might be controversial or I don't like it. But if it's lewd or appears to advocate um, that everybody go out and take drugs, do whatever you want. Now, I will also say that just because the law allows a school to silence speech does not mean that the school is required to silence speech. A school district can say, we would rather be a school district that is more supportive of First Amendment rights. We'd like to use our judgment in a sound manner and only silence speech when we feel we just can't avoid doing that. So most of the speech that's at the core of our contemporary debates sexting, texting, online speech, bullying, and racist speech is pure student speech. And it continues to be governed by the material disruption standard. Schools cannot limit it unless they can meet that test. So now I'm going to turn to a couple of stories uh, that illustrate some of the recurrent problems that I discuss in the book. I'm going to begin with creative artists writers of fiction and people who engage in the pictorial arts. And this is a poster that was done by a high school senior named Sarah Bowman. She had taken a summer course um, in which she was taught to um, take on a personality, uh, often an obsessive person, and do something to explain how that person would think. And this is uh, a chart that says, who killed my dog? Um, he was my best friend. Did you kill my dog? If you did, I will kill you. On and on in this swirl. And she did it uh, during lunch period and hung it up in a corridor where no students saw it because just after she hung it up, the school janitor saw it and said, oh, the sky's falling, and took it down and took her and the poster to the principal. She was an honor student. She'd never been in trouble. She had none, never done anything that would suggest that she would kill anyone. We don't even know if she had a dog, but a very common kind of problem in these cases. So the principal believes her story. He says after he talked to her, he knew this was just creative. Uh, but he decided he 
needed to suspend her for five days and refer the problem to the Board of Education. So the district conducted a number of inquiries and they decided that it would be better to suspend Sarah for 81 and a half days the rest of her senior year. And they also said she couldn't return to school until she saw a psychologist who would certify that it was safe to let her come back because she wasn't a danger to anybody. She sued and the court returned her to school, having found that the school district violated her speech rights. There was no threat once she explained herself to the principal and he knew that she was a good kid. There was nothing to worry about. Um, but this is very common and in another case where the court um, allowed the school to punish a kid who had written a story, the dissenting judge said after today students will have to hide their artwork. They've lost their speech rights. If someone finds their art disturbing, they can be punished. School officials may now subordinate students' freedom of expression to a policy of making high schools cozy places, like daycare centers, where no one can be made to feel uncomfortable by the knowledge that others may have dark thoughts and all the art is of hearts and smiley faces. Sounds a little bit familiar from some of the discussion about universities today. I'm happy to talk about that in the question period. But this brings us to the whole problem of disturbing speech. And one of the most disturbing categories of speech to me, and I assume to many people in this room here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, is disparaging speech addressed to groups or to individuals captured in the term hate speech. Many schools have speech codes. Those are just school rules that prohibit students from disparaging people based on race, ethnicity, sexual identity, and some go even further, talking about physical appearance, like you can't say things about short people. I care a lot about that one. But it's not legal to stop people from commenting on shortness. Um, so students have even been prevented from expressing views that undermine respect for a group, even though they're not actively disparaging. So when I opened, I said that students take both sides of a lot of important issues, and one of them is the treatment of LGBT persons. Um, and both before and after the Supreme Court decided the same-sex marriage case, um, the issue remains quite politically divisive. Many schools have stopped students from wearing shirts that proclaim their sexual identity. They've stopped people from setting up gay-straight alliance clubs. Um, and that is certainly the more predominant form of censorship over um, gender identity. But there's a flip side, and so here's a story that raises some profound issues about the freedom to differ. A Roman Catholic high school student named Daniel Glowacki resisted a lesson in tolerance on Spirit Day. Spirit Day is a day of recognition for LGBT teenagers who've committed suicide. And he told his teacher, I don't accept gays because of my religious views. The teacher told him to leave the classroom. There was no risk of disruption, only of competing ideas. A federal judge later commented that the teacher had modeled oppression and intolerance of student opinion. Other students agreed, and they understood what was going on. As Lewaki left the classroom, they said, why doesn't he have free speech? The legal question, and it's a difficult one, is whether the Constitution permits schools to regulate hurtful speech addressed to groups or individuals. Here's the paradox. Does a liberal secular society, a democracy, that strives to inculcate tolerance and a culture of mutual respect, a country like ours, does it have to tolerate expressions of intolerance? Under our Constitution, the answer is yes. 
Justice Kagan discussed university hate speech codes when she was a law professor here at Harvard, and she concluded that even an exceedingly narrow speech code aimed at discriminatory harassment cannot survive constitutional scrutiny in the United States, unlike in Western Europe, Canada, and many other places that have different legal rules. Justice Alito, too, has pointed out there's no right to be protected from hurtful words. The First Amendment stands in the way. Unfortunately, the federal government and many, many states ask or require schools to punish verbal bullying and taunts without providing any guidance about how to do that consistent with the First Amendment. They just say, do it, and they drop a footnote saying, might be some problem with the First Amendment, figure it out. Uh, the figure it out is my addition. The footnote is theirs. So I'm going to close with a third example. Um, there's a huge growing tendency for schools to reach out and watch what kids say in social media. They've even hired outside firms. They've hired retired FBI agents and police officers, given them a list of students and said, go find out what they're saying online. And then they try to punish them for it. And sometimes they just stumble on what's been said online and try to punish for it. Uh, so their claim is that they can punish offensive speech wherever, whenever, 24-7, as long as the student goes to their school. This is kind of terrifying. So there's a, a case that is currently awaiting an answer from the Supreme Court about whether or not the court will accept the case, and I want to tell you about it. It's the case involving rap music that I referred to in my opening. This is the case of Taylor Bell versus Itawamba Agricultural High School in Greenville, Mississippi. Taylor Bell was an 18-year-old. Now that's significant because he's legally an adult, not a minor. He's an 18-year-old African-American high school senior with a clean disciplinary record. And four girls, or possibly more, in his school told, them, told him that two of the coaches had sexually harassed them, uh, mostly verbally, also looked down their blouses, commented on their appearance. And they were very uncomfortable about it. And nobody thought that the school would listen to the complaints. So during Christmas break, he rented a studio. He wrote a rap song. He recorded it. And he put it online on YouTube and Facebook, hoping to call attention to this really serious problem. He used a fictional character, a persona very much like Sarah Bowman's. That character fit all the norms of gangster rap. The character used hyperbole, hyperbole, street language, and figurative violence. The school suspended him for seven days and sent him to an alternative school for six weeks the rest of the grading period. His mother sued, seeking to have the discipline rescinded and his record expunged. The school never treated what he said as a threat. They allowed him to go to class while the disciplinary proceedings were going on. And recently, the Fifth Circuit, um, sitting what we call en banc, which means it's such an important and difficult case that the entire circuit court, all of the judges, sit together and they reconsider it. And sitting en banc, they reversed the panel of three judges. And they said this was an incredibly profane and vulgar posting fill, filled with threatening, harassing, and intimidating language against the two coaches. Now, what did this kid say? Uh, I'm going to give you a fairly cleaned up version. We have at least one teenager here. We have kids shopping in the back there in the children's section, and we have public TV taping. So among the things he said were, better watch your back, going to get a pistol down your mouth, middle fingers up if you hate that nigga. The two coaches actually were white. Um, so the appellate court said, the school can reach anywhere. They went further than any other court in the nation so far. Um, and they said, if um, the speech is intentionally directed at the school, 
then we're going to use this lesser standard material disruption and allow the school to discipline it. And the court also said that the internet is just too complicated, normal First Amendment rules can't apply, which is in direct contradiction of several very clear Supreme Court rulings already about internet speech. Remember that the whole rationale for making it easier for schools to censor than it is for the government outside of school is that this is a special environment. So how do you then justify taking that special environment rule and applying it everywhere. Um, so if allowed to stand, at least in the circuit where this would be the law, the Fifth Circuit, mostly Texas, Mississippi, um, this would be a drastic expansion of power over um, what kids can say anytime, anywhere. There are also some other problems. This was a whistleblower on a matter of important public concern. This wasn't adolescent humor. This was really serious speech. Minors have a right to speak and to receive communications. And remember, he wasn't even a minor. It's dramatic overreach into the home. And it would substitute school authorities' judgment for parents' judgment. If parents are overseeing what their kids do, and that's a legal presumption that if they think their kids might do something wrong, they're supposed to supervise it. If they don't, it's because they don't think it's a problem. So now the school is going to say, your parents let you do that, but we're not going to let you. That's a whole series of other issues. Um, and then one of the core principles of democracy is that we all have the right to criticize the people in power, whether they're teachers, coaches, principals, or the president of the United States. And if we lose that, then we've become, in the words of several judges, a totalitarian or Stalinist society. Um, so if allowed to stand, and if this kind of action spreads further throughout the country, it would teach young people that there's no place to hide from an authoritarian government whose officials are immune from criticism undermining almost every core principle of the liberal democratic state. Is there any difference between public and private schools? Absolutely, because um, the First Amendment only applies to the government. Congress shall make no law has been understood to be the government. If so what you said today is, does not apply does not apply to private schools, although private schools, like school districts, are perfectly free to say we try to govern ourselves by First Amendment principles. They are under no uh, requirement that they do so. And in fact, particularly if you're talking about religious schools, they might very well choose not to. But you gave an example from a Catholic school. No, that was a Roman Catholic student at a public school. I'm glad we had a chance to clarify that. Thank you, former dean. It was a pleasure. Could you talk a little bit more about bullying and harassment of individuals in the context of what you've been talking about? Oh, I'm about? so glad you asked that question because I had to, you know, slash that. Uh, that to me is, is one of the very troubling ones. Um, the vast majority of bullying incidents do not involve any physical harm. They're words, and they're cruel words. Um, but there isn't a First Amendment doctrine that allows authorities to really try to differentiate among them. And one of the problems in law is always to try to say, is there a bright line where you can say, this speech can be regulated, but no further? Um, so some places have tried to use these hate speech codes about bullying and say, well, if you're bullying based on race or religion, which are protected under the 14th Amendment, we're going to stop you. Um, but if there's no physical contact, physical contact turns it into conduct, which can always be regulated. Words alone, much more problematic. I come up with a suggestion, and I don't know 
if it will be accepted, uh, but I, I propose something called an infringement matrix, which would allow the school and the court to look at the impact on an individual. Because the material disruption standard is really about the school as a whole, the whole school environment. But the infringement matrix would allow a school to say that this repetitive, persistent, um, very targeted, in your face, verbal attack um, was so substantial that it interfered with a particular student's ability to get an education. Now that's a pretty hard standard based on other places where it's used, uh, but that would provide one mechanism for trying to cut down on really severe bullying. And part of the problem is, of course, educators have shown that they don't all have very good judgment, as with the poo-poo head example, right? So I don't think you should suspend a kindergartner for saying poo-poo head, uh, but there are some pretty disturbing things that I've read about in the cases that I wish there were a way to regulate. This is not an excuse, but to what extent is uh, fear of litigation driving school administrators to react in the, uh, the way you've shown very well is so problematic? Excellent question and not surprising coming from a law professor. Um, uh, quite a lot. Uh, you know, in, in the case of, for example, the girl who prayed over her lunch, uh, they're worried that somebody will say, you violated the Establishment Clause by letting a kid express her own religious sentiments. The, the reason I'm not so sympathetic to that is that very often once a, a school silences a student, they dig their heels in. And even when it becomes clear to them that they don't have a leg to stand on, they would rather litigate, which is very costly. And some of these lawsuits have cost up to a million dollars in damages and lawyers' fees, and they often have to pay the plaintiff's fee as well. So uh, they are driven in part by fear that somebody's going to blame them, uh, but they also spend a lot of money that could be put to better use defending the in indefensible position. Do you have any comment on the case that's in the news from Boston Latin where some parents and the organization supporting them are apparently upset that the school did not punish certain speech more harshly. Yes. Um, also a great local question. Um, so at Boston Latin, there were allegations that there were two particular times when students said racist things to other students. And then there were allegations that there were a lot of racist comments, particularly about um, police abuses of power uh, that were placed on social media. On inquiry, the social media comments were not from students at Boston Latin. In fact, many of them were not even from residents of Massachusetts. So it was unclear what the students thought that the school could do about them, uh, even if they had not been protected. Uh, the two others, um, one of them appeared to have been substantiated in an investigation. They never really said exactly what was said uh, between the students. And they called the speaker in to talk to the principal, the, associate, the assistant principal, and they had a talk, and the person apologized. That is absolutely fine. That's not the coercive power of the state. There's nothing on that student's personal record. Hopefully he learned something from it. And Boston Latin has also come up with a number of plans moving forward, which are all constitutional, which are all consistent with the kinds of things that I recommend that schools do. I, I call for constructive intervention, for creating an atmosphere that is not tolerant. Now, this is a more complicated answer to my question about tolerating the intolerance. We, we can't necessarily punish them and destroy their permanent records. But we can teach them to be more empathetic. We can say we're not a community in which this kind of language is welcomed. And we want you to think about how to interact with each other. And that's also part of why I think this is so important for the health of our democracy, that students have to learn how to disagree in a manageable way and how to listen to things 
that they don't like and stand up and respond to them with words, not with fists, and not with demands that somebody be put in jail or expelled. Um, in, your, in your studies and writing this book, um, and you just made a, a small um, reference to one school that is headed in the right direction as far as you're concerned. Um, are there other schools across the country that you've run into who are basically models of the type of democracy and open freedom discussions and you know, et cetera that you would consider as, as really beacons of what should be happening in our, in our uh, society and public schools? I, I don't know that they're models overall, but I, I certainly found some episodes that were handled beautifully. So one example was in uh, Novato, uh, school district in California where there are a lot of recent immigrants and, and interestingly an African American student in a largely white and Hispanic school wrote an op-ed piece for the school newspaper that was very critical of immigration and basically accused a lot of the immigrants in the school of being undocumented and it was, it was nasty and it was published, but then the principal realized how many of the Hispanic students, Mexican-American students, were upset. And she collected the undistributed copies of the paper and said she wasn't going to hand them out, um, which was a violation, and that went to court. But in the meantime, she held first a big assembly on a voluntary basis in the school at which the guidance counselors came and they did a bunch of exercises with crayons and they allowed everybody to explain how they felt. And then they had a community meeting. And uh, it was very well attended and the author of the op-ed and his father came and they heard what everybody had to say and they spoke. And it, you know, didn't make up for everything but it apparently cleared the air, and it was a very productive way of handling this. In First Amendment parlance, the best cure for noxious speech is more and better speech, and that's what schools should do. The next time something came up at that school, actually the same kid wanted to write another nasty column about something else. I forget <laughs> what. So he had learned, but only in a very targeted way. And, um, what this school principal did was she called the local chapter of the ACLU. And she said, what do you think I should do about this? And they said, it's protected speech. And she said, OK. And then I'll protect it. And this also goes to the litigation problem. She now had backup. If somebody complained, she could say, no, no, I consulted. Mm -hmm. And she was really smart to consult the people who would be most likely to tell her honestly that this was protected speech because school lawyers who work for the school district too often tell their clients what their clients want to hear and that is not being a good lawyer whether your client is the school district or somebody who wants to rob a bank or any number of other situations I won't go into here. Is the kind of useful work you're doing codifying and sifting through, you know, sorting uh, isn't it the case that it ultimately can't find a foolproof procedure to... Okay, I, I hear kind of two things in that question. I'll try to answer both of them. Um, so the first is uh, just, just codifying, sorting, and really explaining in the way that I'm trying to identify what the law really means uh, because too many school officials as well as federal judges kind of throw up their hands and say, oh, this is so complicated, who knows? And so I'm saying, no, actually, the law is pretty clear if you try to understand it. Um, is that sufficient? Well, of course, it's never sufficient. And the only way to really enforce it is to have people who are quite heroic bring these lawsuits. It's not easy to sue your school district uh, if you're a parent, if you're the student, and then maybe you have younger siblings who are going to be in that school district. And a fair number of these plaintiffs who sue their school districts end up having to move to another school district. It, it's, so we depend on individuals to understand the framework and to demand that authorities abide by it. That's part of it. The other part is really the incentives. 
and I think that's related back also to the litigation question that was asked earlier. And unfortunately, the loudest voices in this area are usually the censors. That's the one parent who hears something happened at the school where they don't like the play that was chosen to be the school play, and they go in and they demand that the principals cut this off and stop it. And most principals say, oh, I can't deal with this mother anymore. And they cancel because there's nothing to be gained in the administrator's mind from standing up for principal. And so one of the things I think is really important is before there's a controversy in a school district, and this is all very local, our control of education is at a very local level, um, when there isn't a decision that's already been made that people feel, oh, I made the decision, I have to stand up for it, is to go in and say, we really want to be a school district that conveys the culture of civil liberties to our children. That's really the most important message we can give. We want them to understand why people have a right to say hateful things and to take that with them into adult life so they can be good citizens and appreciate what makes us such a special democracy um, and to try to get people to sign on and to show the principle that there's support for being respectful for constitutionally protected rights. Very, very important. What percentage of the suits that are brought against um, school districts, principals, schools, would you say are actually successful for the plaintiffs? Um, the cases that are brought tend to have a great deal of merit because of the exceptions and all the power that the school districts have. So um, I, I can't answer it in numerical terms, in terms of how many are successful, because um, as I said, the judges are part of the problem. And there are too many federal judges who say, I just don't understand this law. It doesn't give me enough guidance, with others who write beautiful opinions with very inspiring language about why this matters. Um, but one of the discouraging things is we have a, a doctrine called qualified immunity, uh, which holds that if the law isn't sufficiently clear, then the individual government actor can't be held responsible for getting it wrong. And when these cases are brought, if the individuals, the principal, the bus driver, or the, whoever it is, is named, uh, often if they're named as an individual, they say, oh, qualified immunity. I had no way of knowing that this particular form of speech was protected. So I'll give you an example. Um, there was a case involving a young woman named Avery Doninger, and uh, it raised a number of issues, but she was punished for her speech by being told she couldn't stand for elective office uh, for student government. That's a common punishment. And uh, what usually happens in those cases, and happened in her cases, was she won on a write-in ballot. Um, so not a very successful strategy for a school principal. But at the election assembly, all these kids showed up with t-shirts that said, Team Avery. <laughs> and they were told, you can't wear Team Avery t-shirts. She's not a candidate. And the school principal said, qualified immunity. And basically, the, the appellate court said, you get qualified immunity on that because there was never a t-shirt before that said, Team Avery. I mean, basically, that's what it reduces to. It's, was, it has to be so exact. And another school said, we didn't know that armbands that weren't black, that weren't in protest against the Vietnam War, but about something totally different. We had no idea that was protected speech. There, the court finally said, no, you really, this looks so much like Tinker, we're not letting you get away with that. But very often, they're able to say, if there was no case that was absolutely like this, OK, we're not holding you responsible. That's really bad. It sends a bad message that you don't have to try to 
understand the law, or even worse, that you'll be worse off if you understand the law, because then we'll hold you responsible. So ignorance is bliss. And in some of these cases that have been litigated, you know, the, the head of one school board said, no, I, I have no idea what First Amendment, no, I, I never thought about it. I had no idea. And they feel very comfortable saying that. That's a big cultural problem, more than a legal problem. Yes? So you've mentioned clothing a couple of times. Is clothing worn by students for religious reasons definitely um, protected? It's obviously wonderful, power. wonderful question. If it is speech, much more complicated answer if it is exercise, because under Fed, this is a whole other thing, but I'm going to give you a very concise answer. Under federal law, uh, it is no longer the case that a person has a right to be exempted from a rule that applies to everyone because their religion demands it. However, the reason I stress federal law is that many, many states, more than half the states, have said, we don't agree with that. And we're passing our own laws that say you do have a right to an exemption. So if there's a rule that says no hats, and you're supposed to wear a hat, it depends where you live. But if a hat is speech, then you get to wear it. So you can see why we lawyers are so well occupied so much of the time. Thank you all for coming. They saw their work as rooted in a labor market transaction, not an emotional connection. For household workers, the language of uh, care and kin masked their central concerns of rights and responsibilities.